And so I am here to talk about the, uh, the KPG impact, which is basically a huge asteroid impact uh, approximately 66 million years ago that caused the extinction of non-avian dinosaurs. And um, so how do we know that this impact exists? Because I know even now in 2022, when you read some uh, internet articles or books, they sometimes tell you that um, the whole asteroid thing is a conspiracy. But it is not confirmed. Now I'm here to uh, first tell you how we know that there's an asteroid. Um, so as you can see, this is a um, a cross-section of sedimentary rock. Uh, you know what that is? That's basically, um, as you can see, uh, the things they, they, they like to deposit. Now, sedimentary rock are basically deposit material that is um, petrified to form rock. And um, sometimes, for example, in the floodplain, you can have uh, deposition going on, and you have these building, uh, building up of sediments. Now, over different ages and different times, you can have uh, different um, patterns of sedimentation. So this is what you get uh, over millions of years. The, um, the deposition kind of differs. Uh, between different times, and that's how we uh, divide our history into different time periods. As you can see, uh, there's a white layer right here. It is actually composed of a metal iridium. And, uh, right, uh, I'll stand closer. Okay, so, um, you see, this um, spike of iridium uh, doesn't appear in one single rock. It appears globally on every single spot on the planet where the Maastrichtian dirt shows. Uh, As you can see, uh, it is found across North America, in Asia, and Australia, even in Arctic regions, where the Cretaceous start shows. So, okay, so uh, what is iridium? Uh, as you saw, that, that long, that white line, horizontal strata, white line of, of iridium, what is it? It has the atomic number 77, it is hard, brittle, silver white, and it's a transition metal in the platinum group. Um, so here's some examples of iridium. And here's a graph of uh, the abundance of iridium in our um, crust. So one of the characteristics of iridium is its rarity. Now emphasize that word, because as you can see here, wait, let's go back. Um, as you can see here, iridium is right down at the right corner. Uh, it is one of the nine rarest stable elements in our crust. Now, exactly how much is the um, iridium? There is 0.01 parts per million in our Earth's crust. So it is very rare. So how exactly uh, is there a global deposition, a sudden global deposition, around the globe 66 million years ago? We were perplexed until we start to measure the amount of iridium in extraterrestrial rock, also known as meteorites. So, as you can see, it's 0.5 parts per million. That's over 500 times the abundance of iridium in our Earth's crust. So, I guess anyone with a functional brain can form a hypothesis of how something happened. And, uh, right. Approximately uh, 66 million years ago, we used radiometric dating, the uh, ratio of isotopes in rocks, to determine when does this happen. The impact happened at exactly this time, uh, approximately 66 million years ago, actually one year earlier than previously estimated. And um, it is likely that the asteroid came from the main belt, the asteroid belt, which is kind of controlled by both the Sun and the gas giant Jupiter. Now, a very probable uh, circumstance is that um, Jupiter, as a giant planet, gave a piece of rock a gravitational kick which uh, basically kicked the rock towards our planet. Now, um, in the last slide, there was a picture of a giant rock plunging into the atmosphere. Um, that is probably not the case, according to the latest studies, because there's not just one impact crater, but there's another contemporary one um, in, in Ukraine, and there's another one at the North Lake, which falls in the Mideast. So, it was, it was sort of like a global impact. It was not one. If you see, this is the impact of Schumacher to be 9 on uh, the gas giant Jupiter. You notice that the comet, it didn't hit in one hole. There were multiple pieces that affected this impact. Now, it's probably similar what happened to Earth 66 million years ago. And the crater is not noticeable if you just look at it with the naked eye. This is where it hit Mexico, Chicxulub Crater. So, at first, scientists didn't know if there were actually a crater 66 million years ago, a form 66 million years ago. But um, after some detailed mapping, these are um, sinkholes, and uh, other methods are just gravitational mapping. We can see a very apparent abnormal area around the Chicxulub crater, and that has told us that there is 100% a asteroid that hit um, this area. I originally had a GIF of how an asteroid impact crater performs. It's not as simple as a rock plunging into it. There's actually very complex movements of rocks and stuff, but I did include it. So. Um, and here is the uh, current consensus of the um, asteroid crater. As you can see, it's pretty darn big. Half of it is in the ocean, and part of it's on land, a trough you can see, and the sinkholes, the sea notes we call them, are outside that um, radius. 
And now, there are also other evidence that are associated with the area of spike. Uh, for example, these are called shock forms, and in a normal volcanic eruption, you can see a, a one-directional shock plane caused by the volcano. But here you can see multiple shock planes in the same crystal, which is, which is a normal, we don't see it anywhere. And these are called tectites. So basically you have this debris that gets sprung up during the impact. They, uh, they go up so high, they escape the atmosphere, then they fall back down due to the gravity of Earth. And during their uh, re-entry, they, they burn up and they melt. And then they condense into pieces of glass. Now also, these are called um, ejecta deposits. So basically, uh, you see, when the asteroid hit, the, um, the pieces of Earth, it sprungs up, goes in all kinds of directions. Some of it goes up, and how some of it goes sideways. And but deposit quite immediately, we call them ejecta deposits. As you can see, they have very unique sedimentary structures. And, yeah. So, these are some other evidence we have, and the, we know how dramatic the impact is. So, here's another one. Uh, as you can see, if we map the, if we measure the, uh, like the thickness of the dis disrupted layer of um, the most recent dirt, we can see that, we can see that it sort of forms a bullseye around the jigsaw crater. So, the closer you get to the crater, the thicker that disrupted layer becomes. So, um, are we? Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> okay, yeah, let's move on. Now, uh, let's talk about the impact itself and what we know what happened um, during the impact. So, 60 minutes, one hour into the impact, we have uh, earthquakes, of course, because, uh, you know, giant rocks, they hit Earth, Earth is like a giant bell, and the rock hits are causing it to shake. Um, yeah, so phase one is about as the stuff you would imagine in your mind first about how, uh, what, it, uh, what an asteroid may cause when it hits Earth. Uh, of course, it will cause hurricane force winds across the globe. Uh, do note that magnitude 10.1 earthquake is uh, enough to topple skyscrapers. So that causes some dinosaurs to fall over, unfortunately. And, uh, and there's also a very huge, you might know a bit of geography, and um, you might realize that huge earthquakes tend to cause huge tsunamis. Uh, now, those tsunamis have been estimated to reach over 250 meters in length, and they occur throughout the globe. So we predicted them to happen, and we have evidence of them happening. This is global. Uh, but, as I stated, uh, this is not enough to cause a mass extinction, it causing the death of over 70% of the organisms. Remember, that killed off 100% of the non avian dinosaurs. It killed off every single one of them. So, the following effects are uh, also very deadly. You have phase 2, 24 hours into the impact. Uh, we have the big oven effect. So basically the big pieces fall to the ground and cause earthquakes and stuff. Right? That's phase one. And phase two is the relatively smaller particles. When they enter the atmosphere, they burn up and they release infrared radiation. And during a normal, say, a normal uh, meteorite of uh, 10 meters across, they go into the atmosphere, they burn up, they release a minimal amount of radiation. That's it. But this is a different thing. We have multiple pieces of giant asteroids that is crashed into, pre into pieces and they don't get sprung up and re-enter the atmosphere all around the planet. Now that is a lot of uh, meteorites entering the uh, atmosphere and releasing infrared radiation, so much that it's estimated to raise the temperature uh, for uh, around 10 degrees. Now, at first glance, that, that might not seem like a huge number, but it, it should be noted that uh, most of that heat radiation is absorbed by opaque objects such as rocks and dirt and you. So, what I'm basically saying is during this phase two, any uh, organism that is not protected um, by rock and water and um, is not transparent, is baked alive. So any giant dinosaur is unable to stand this. The only way you can survive this, two ways actually. One, you can go underwater, because water, and you, you might know, has very high specific heat. It protects you from those radiation. And, um, and you can also hide under, underground, because the rocks and dirt around you also create radiation for you. Now that huge wave of heat radiation also causes a canopy collapse, which is basically, it sets off every single forest on, in the world on fire. And that causes the entire forest to fall over and form a layer of coal. We discovered it right above the array of spike. So that is an evidence of phase 2 occurring. Now we also have um, phase 3 is uh, a bit long, it, um, 10 years into the impact. And this is when we get to the impact winner. Now you might um, know the implications of nuclear war is that um, the pieces generated from the impact, uh, small, uh, fine uh, particles that um, suspend in the air, they, they block out insulation. And there are only two energy inputs for us. One is the uh, consistent uh, but finite um, geothermal energy from the center of the Earth. Uh, they are uh, utilized very limit, limited by us, and um, uh, deep sea creatures who are closer to them use them more often. Now, the other energy source comes from the sun. Now, we know that during the impact, we have big, huge uh, chunks of particles that causes earthquakes and make dinosaurs fall over. That's phase one. And the smaller particles that burn up and uh, 
and bake all the dinosaurs alive. An easy open, an easy bake open effect. That's you. And a small, very small suspending particles in the air that blocks out the sun. This is the ultimate killer. Because animals like us, we need energy to survive. What do we eat? We need, we need big organic uh, bio, bio molecules like glucose and uh, other sugars. We need them to uh, use our mitochondria you know, to release energy and then stay alive and stuff. Now that energy has to depend on the producers, the plants, who manufacture giant uh, biological molecules like glucose using energy from the sun. What if there's no energy from the sun? All the energy is blocked out by the small sedimentation. Well, what happens? Well, yeah, everyone dies, apparently. Uh, animals who are big enough, uh, who are small enough to not need much energy has more possibility to survive than giant animals. So this is the ultimate cause of all dinosaurs dying. It is not the global earthquake, 100 meter tall tsunamis, and hurricanes, and decking tracks or volcanoes around the globe. It is not the uh, easy make open effect that makes everything alive. This is the main reason. It blocks out all the energy. The dinosaurs starve to death. Now, the, uh, the meat-eating ones may be happy for a few days, but then they realize there's nothing left to eat after all the herbivores die out, and they die out too. So, uh, so we ultimately come to the final and the longest phase, phase four. Uh, so it's, Almost, it affects almost 100,000 years into the, um, after the impact. Now, this is when um, the opposite effect uh, from the uh, phase 3 happens. You see, phase 3, they block on insulation, right? So the temperature would drop dramatically, almost 26 degrees. But then things start to dramatically change. You see, as asteroids crash into uh, Mexico, it, 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 it kind of deposits a layer of uh, carbonate. Now, if, if you know something about chemistry, you might know that, um, that carbonate, well, when they undergo thermal decomposition, they release this particular gas called carbon dioxide. And this gas is also known as a greenhouse gas. So um, over the course of 100,000 years, we will see a very dramatic effect of the greenhouse effect, similar to what we see today. Now, it is actually a very pretty slow rate of change, 13 degrees um, across 100,000 years. But um, ecosystems are fragile, and that causes, especially some shallow sea ecosystems, to crumble. And um, by extension, a lot of animals and plants and other organisms go extinct. So that is the final uh, implication of the impact. Now, uh, there is a remarkable fossil site that has been only discovered recently. It is located in South Dakota, United States, and it's called Tannis. There's a documentary made about it. Now, as you can see, it too contains that white uh, iridium spike. But what's special is that it not only preserves that iridium spike, but some animals around it too. So, uh, let's move on. Um, here is a Hornstein dinosaur mummified leg. Uh, it suffered from mineralization. Basically, minerals uh, went into the pores on its body and fossilized. And as you can see, the leg is ripped off from the rest of the body. Uh, in a very dramatic, uh, fast spiral, and it's literally right on top of the iridium spike. Uh, now we also see, uh, normally, we also see a lot of fish um, with that broken dinosaur. Now, you might know fossilization requires really fast spiral. What? What are these animals so quick that they're preserved so beautifully and completely? Now this little detail may help. Uh, what are these? Little round rocks. We call them ejectospherols. I talked about them. Basically they are the uh, molten pieces of rock caused by the impact. So what is going on here? That is South Dakota, North America. Back in 66 million years ago, Mastrichtian and Cretaceous, um, North America was divided by a, a, a mountain of water. We call it the West Interior Sea. Now, you can try to think and predict what happens when the asteroid hits. Yeah, tsunami. So this is very likely what happened. We have dinosaurs and fish discovered together caused by tsunami. Well, a piece of molten Mexico rains on them and fall into the gills of the fish. It's uh, very brutal. And here's also a very a remarkable fossil. Uh, it's the skin of a triceratops, the very famous dinosaur that lived at the very end of the dinosaur era. And so what died out? You see, here is a complete overview of the fauna of the late Cretaceous uh, North America. Now, as you can see, I, you can't see the light. Can you? Go back. Okay, so as you can see, we have giant sauropod titanosaurs, and uh, this great one is the Tyrannosaurus. Uh, we have giant flying pterosaurs and starches. We have hadrosaurs, oviraptors, or even lymans, ankylosaurs, and um, all kinds of smaller animals. We have pretty derived burrows, sort of like spirals and waterfalls of today back then. And also in the water, we see giant sharks, not smaller than the great white, giant turtles, archelon, for example. We have giant predatory fish, mosasaurs, plesiosaurs, and giant crocodiles, and ammonites, which are pretty common back then. Now, what, what are killed in the extinction? What is left? What is left is the small animals. The, the trend is pretty apparent, isn't it? Only the small animals survive and live today. As we can see, crocodiles, smaller ones, uh, waterfalls, and uh, some flying birds, relatively smaller ones. And we have certain kinds of fish, arthropods. Um, we have mollusks and uh, 
mammals, which are our ancestors. So what survived are the animals small enough to withstand, to hide on the ground, to avoid phase two, and to, uh, to survive the, uh, the long impact winter that took away all the energy, because they are very small and they need minimal energy to survive. Now, this is what we get today. So uh, this is kind of ironic, because dinosaurs are iconic for their large size. The largest dinosaur can perhaps exceed 70 tons, and it is exactly this element, their large size, that killed them. Please note that dinosaurs are not actually extinct. You see birds, they are totally dinosaurs. They are just as dinosaur as Triceratops and Stegosaurus. They are, they are clay of their own dinosaur and raptors. So they're actually pretty close related to T. rex, if um, this really speaking. So, let's move on. And so here are some other theories that are apparently wrong. You might hear them on the internet. Um, some people say that dinosaurs die from poisonous gas, poisonous gas from the comets. It doesn't make sense. And um, some people say caterpillars ate all the food. Why the marine animals then? And yeah, I think this one's pretty prominent in the media. Uh, some people say, mammals are more advanced than dinosaurs. Mammals are more blooded. They can eat the dinosaurs' eggs. How can mammals go into the water and eat the, the non-existent eggs of, of plesiosaurs that don't even lay eggs? That doesn't make sense. And by the way, uh, like, by that time, about 50 to 60% of the mammals also died. They were pretty big mammals back in the size of dogs. And some people say that dinosaurs were allergic to angiosperms, flowering plants. Again, it doesn't affect the marine community. And um, tens of million years um, after the rise of these plants, uh, why do we see a, a dramatic, uh, sudden termination of these animals? It doesn't explain. And um, the same applies to diseases. Why does it appear to both see It doesn't spread through uh, the water. So, um, how does disease only affect bigger animals? Again, it doesn't make sense. So, these can all be scientifically falsified. And, um, yeah. So, what, are, what, what did we learn from this impact 66 million years ago that killed off the non avian dinosaurs? But using the fossil records are only evidence of these mass, mass extinctions, and it tells us that uh, ecosystems, they can collapse really quickly and take millions of years to recover. And, um, but you know, the KPG mass impact by extinction uh, taught us two major lessons. Um, so one is realizing the potential catastrophes caused by uh, asteroids. So uh, people start to realize, media starts to report of uh, asteroids passing by Earth, and people start, start, start to panic. We have a reason to panic either. And also, uh, two, realizing the implications of a nuclear winter. So uh, that asteroid has taught us a lot about um, how we fragile we are against an impact winter like this. So, uh, so basically, uh, understanding world-ending catastrophes of the ancient world teaches us how to uh, prevent them in, in the future. Uh, we can learn from these extinctions and how ecosystems change over time to uh, fully uh, predict what happens if uh, our, our current trend continues. We see our current global warming and uh, a potential nuclear war. Only by studying paleontology and uh, subject geology and subjects as such can we understand how ecosystems change over time and how we can counter these changes when uh, they happen to 